difficulties here. All right. I think this is the first day of summer. Is that right? It is. Yes. Happy summer solstice. <clears throat> For each case, there will be a public hearing. We ask that the applicant keep their presentation to under 10 minutes. They may reserve two minutes as a rebuttal. We ask that the public keep their comments to two minutes unless they have previously requested in writing for five minutes as a representative of a group or organization. Pursuant to the provision of section 2.68.030 of the Metropolitan Code of Laws, notice is hereby given that a final hearing before this commission is appealable to the Chancery Court of Davidson County or the Circuit Court of Davidson County. This is statutory writ of certiorari. You are advised to seek your own independent legal counsel to ensure that your appeal is filed in a timely manner, that all procedural requirements are met. You should also seek independent legal advice regarding the applicability of the writ of certiorari to the specific decision of the Historic Zoning Commission. First on our agenda is adoption of the May 11 and May 17, 2023 minutes. Commissioners, any questions or is there a motion? Chairman, I move for approval. There's a motion by the vice chair and a second by second. Commissioner Cotton. Thank you. Ms. Ziegler, adoption of the agenda. Actually, before we get to that, oh, if yeah. we could take just a minute, I'd like to introduce you to Grace Brandland. And come on up. She is our, our newest employee. And uh, just tell us a little, or turn on the mic. Now. And tell us a little bit about you. Hi, um, I'm Grace Brandland. I'm from Nashville, um, and I have a background in interior architecture and design, but um, I'm excited to meet you all and be working with you. Thank you and welcome. She's going to be our, our, our front face, our front desk, so she's going to be sort of our triage person. So she's going to help people with all their just initial questions about how the property is zoned and which guidelines they're following and, and that type of thing, in addition to... Uh, helping staff with applications, getting things in the system and that type of thing. Very good. Very good. Thank you. And in terms of the agenda, uh, we have several changes. Item number 10, which is 3713 Princeton, it was changed to be an administrative review. Item number 16, 816 Boscobel, the application was incomplete. Number 18, 839 Ackland Avenue, they've requested to remove the item. 20, which is 210 South 10th Street, um, had some incorrect date on their notice, so they are deferring till next month. And number 22, which is 1005 Bate Avenue, they requested deferral. So that's items 10, 16, 18, 20, and 22. Thank you, Robin. Commissioners, move to approve the agenda as revised. So moved. Commissioner Cotton, seconded by Beth Cashin. Okay. All right. All in favor? Aye. Okay. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. I thought the minutes were moved and seconded, but was the question? Oh, gotcha. Thank you so much. We missed that one, Commissioner. All in, all in, we're going to backtrack. Legal, is that okay? All right. <laughs> yes, we had a first and second. All in favor? Aye. Seeing none opposed, that passes. Thank you. Are there any council members present today? Council member Cash, thank you. And I guess you'll... I'll wait. Okay, all right, thank you. All right, I think uh, consent agenda is up as well. Also, I'd just like to acknowledge on the administrative permits that sometimes we don't see all the work that the... Uh, staff has done, but it is on um, SharePoint that's around 62 permits, preservation permits were issued this past month. So I want to thank the staff for that. All right, uh, the consent agenda. Items on the consent agenda will be voted on at a single time. No individual public hearing will be held, nor will the commission debate these items unless a member of the public or the commission requests that the item be removed from the consent agenda. Items pulled from the consent agenda will be heard at the end of the agenda. 
So if anybody does um, have a case that they would like to pull from the consent agenda, once that case is called, you can just raise your hand and uh, we'll be on the lookout for it and pull it from the agenda if needed. The first case on the consent agenda is uh, 123 Second Avenue South. It's for signage. The next case is 1304 Ashwood Avenue, new construction of an addition and outbuilding, and it has a setback determination. The next one is 201 Fall Street, new construction of an outbuilding. Uh, the next one is 10 Lee Avenue, it's for signage. The next one is 1230 McChesney Avenue, uh, it's an addition. 317 South 11th Street, new construction of an addition um, with a setback determination. 1405 Ashwood Avenue, uh, new construction, uh, it's an addition and outbuilding. And um, staff recommends approval of the items on the consent agenda with that ap applicable conditions, finding that the applications meet the design guidelines of their respective overlays. Thank you, Joseph. Motion to approve. So moved. Vice Chair. Second by Commissioner Johnson. All right. All in favor? Okay. Seeing none opposed, and that motion passes. The consent agenda passes as well. Okay, so the first violation we'll be discussing today is 1311 Second Avenue North. This is located in Germantown and is an addition to two pre of uh, two turn of century folk Victorian homes. Good. All right. So I'm going to go with a little bit of background on this one since this one's been going on for quite some time. An addition was approved for this property back in May of 2019. It was a rare addition that connected both homes in the back as well as rehab work on both structures. A preservation permit for the addition was issued in August of 2020. The rehab permit was not issued at this time because the applicant hadn't met all the conditions that the commission put on the approval. So the property then changed hands in December of 2021 and staff became aware that work had begun in January of this year. So that was work on both the addition and on the unpermitted rehab work. Staff was able to issue the rehab permit as well as a foundation of permit in February. We also issued a revision to the addition permit to address some changes to the addition. And in May of this year, staff conducted a framing inspection on the addition since it was far enough along for one. This had, this had not been requested. Staff just visited, visited the site. At this time, multiple violations were found on both the existing homes and on the addition. I'll go a little bit more on that in just a second. Um, the applicant does request to retain all the violations. They're also requesting to remove two windows on the existing frame house. This is not going to be addressed as part of the violation. That will be addressed in a minute. I believe that's one of Jenny's applications. So let's go over the um, issues real quick. The first is the removal of two windows on the brick house, which was formerly 1313, I believe. As a condition of approval for the addition in the rehab work, commission required that the applicant have staff review the removal of any windows. Unfortunately, sometime between January of 2021 and December of 2022, the windows were removed. Staff was not notified. They were just removed at some point. So the work as it stands does not meet the guidelines, but staff does recommend the replacement since the windows obviously are no longer present. We also recommend that the applicant uses the same windows that were used or approved for the side elevations as well. The second issue is with the connector piece on both sides of the addition that connect to both the structures. On the right elevation, which is the upper photo, that connector piece should step down about three and a half feet. On the southern elevation, the connector piece should step down about two feet, nine inches. There's also a secondary roof slope on that southern elevation that has a lower eave that again is visible in the lower photograph. As constructed, the historic ridges of both the brick house and the wood frame have, have effectively been extended 
So there's no connector piece that it's lower as per the plan. That secondary roof form on the southern elevation also does not exist, and the eave was brought up to meet the historic eave as well. Staff finds this not to be appropriate as effectively eliminating the historic roof form on both historic buildings. There's also no dif differentiation between the historic root sort homes and then the additions as well. So staff finds that this does not meet the guidelines. The final issue is the height of the addition. As approved, the addition should be about half a foot taller than the bridge structure. As measured from just shy of the bridge, it's about a foot taller. Staff finds that this could be appropriate given the addition so far back in the lot. And as approved, it was off the ridge. So if the other, um, if the other violations are corrected, staff finds that this could be appropriate. So with that, staff recommends that historic ridges on both historic structures be corrected to mask their historic form and that the connector pieces be constructed as previously approved at 1311 Second Avenue North within 60 days of the commission's decision. Finding that as instructed, the roof forms do not meet section 5B1 of the guidelines and section 3E8A. Staff also recommends the approval of the increased height if the other roof form corrections are made, finding that with this condition, the additional height meets section 5B2 for additions. Staff also recommends the installation of new windows in the front facade of the brick stu structure that match the original and dimensions, design, and lights. Staff finds the removal does not meet section 2B1 for repairs and offers a solution of replacing them where they no longer exist. Kind of a lot. Um, do you have any questions before I sit down? Good. I believe the applicant's here. Thank you, Kelly. Okay. Good afternoon. Thanks so much for having us on the agenda today. We appreciate your hard work in preserving historic Nashville. I'm Ashley Stockton Massey. I'm with the ownership group of 1311 Second Avenue. Uh, I don't want to repeat too much of what she said just for time's sake, but we did acquire the property in December of 2021 uh, for $3 million from Stephen Baskin. It's two historic homes, as mentioned, on 0.4 acres. Originally, we were going to be the tenant for this space, and Stephen Baskin was going to be the developer. Uh, Stefan acquired the property in June of 2017 and worked with a few different architects and the Historic Commission to get the approvals. He came to us in 2021 and indicated that he wanted to sell the property. And at that time, we were so invested in the space and the work that had been done, we decided to purchase the property and inherit uh, the work that Stefan had done with the architects and the commission at that time. Since then, the Historical Commission staff member uh, have not that was originally involved no longer works with the commission and kelly and jenny have taken over and like us tried to pick up where others may have left off um this is a unique situation that creates a layer of complication to the deal and that's part of why we are here today uh, we appreciate you listening to our presentation in reference to the first violation the historic windows in the brick house uh, it's a little bit confusing as the staff report states, we met on site two times, submitted a spec package for the historic windows uh, to staff with locations outlined on the spec package, including the brick house. We had a virtual meeting about the window replacements and we received email approval on May 16th from staff that said we agreed all windows on the brick house could re be replaced. With that, that was our marching order to order the historic windows. Um, and we were a little bit confused about the violation given that we had the email confirming that we were allowed to replace the windows in the brick house. Um, and so we are respectfully requesting the same way to move forward uh, with the plan is, and we already have the windows ordered because we were given prior approval. Uh, the second violation is a little bit more complicated, so I brought our expert architect here, Rimmick, uh, to talk a little bit about that. So I'll turn the floor over to him, uh, and we'll invite any discussion on that. Thank you. I'm Rimmick Moore with Rimmick Architecture. Um, as Ashley stated, this project's been going on a long time and has had multiple owners and even multiple designers. We were brought on about uh, early 19, um, to take over the project as architect of record. At that point, it had already had a previous designer that had gone through the entitlements 
and the historic uh, approvals. So we were just sort of bringing those documents to a point where they could be bid, permitted, and built. Um, at the time, also, there was a different uh, use proposed for the space. Uh, then later on, when it changed hands, the, uh, the new ownership group, you know, desires for this to be an event space, which we, which is in line with what we originally had designed. However, once construction started, uh, the site conditions were uh, prohibiting the uh, the desired elevation of the of the floor that we wanted. So basically, for ADA purposes, this uh, event space needed to all be one level. Uh, so the two houses had two different finished floor elevations, of course, and so. Uh, it was decided to raise the floor of the, the, the right house to meet the finished floor ele elevation of the addition and the left house. And it is at this point when the ridge was raised, and that is what is causing the construction issue with the connector. Um, the, the builder that is constructing this, based on that condition, that is why he connected the houses as such to not create uh, a dead valley for water intrusion. If those um, connectors were lowered, there would be a dead valley on both of those roofs and uh, cause a water, potential water issue in the future for the owners and the longevity of the building for both structures. So this is why the builder proceeded uh, in making those connections in that way. And so, We've been struggling on how to remedy, I mean, the, the drawings were sort of designed and approved as per the guidelines, and th that was certainly the intention from our side and from the owner's side. It was just a happenstance of construction, site conditions, um, and then trying to make everything uh, accessible on the inside that caused the raising of that ridge um, and thus the construction uh, to be sort of not delineated as as originally intended. I think that's it. We'll open it up to any questions at this point. We'll hold our question. Thank you. Thank you. Open public hearing. Close public hearing. From my standpoint, um, <clears throat> that's a pretty major change from the original permitted structure. And the fact that that was instituted without any communication with the staff is of concern to me. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I agree. Um, it's Unfortunately, not un, un, too uncommon that we see situations like this where uh, what was originally permitted per design that was submitted to the Zoning Commission was changed either by the builder or uh, changes of ownership happen. But uh, we as a commission typically hold applicants to what was originally approved and permitted by the staff. Um, and it's standard preservation practice to separate an addition like this in terms of the roof roof planes and there, there are design uh, i understand there are design solutions to um water infiltration and and roof slope etc uh that i feel like probably with with the original staff person if it was sean I, i'm assuming it was sean um can be worked out uh, and would have been worked out with the original designer so i understand the complications with this but um, I don't, I'm not convinced that we need to allow this uh, violation based on what's been presented to us today. So there's twofold to the violation. I think you're referring to the. I was referring to the, to the roof form, and yeah, absolutely. Um, I There's been put forward today that there were email 
um, correspondence approving the removal of the original historic windows from the front of the building. We, I don't believe, saw that in any of our packet, and it's not something, based on my experience, that would have ever been approved in the first place uh, to remove uh, good windows that still have good integrity and uh, are not rotten. So, again, I agree with the staff recommendation on this on this one. Thank you, Commissioner. I, um, I, I concur with my other commissioners and uh, and would note to the applicant, to anybody else listening, is that when there are site conditions that are discovered uh, and the the applicant goes to the commission uh, to work through those site conditions, you can usually find solutions that meet the guidelines. Uh, the builder doesn't always understand the guidelines enough and assumes that things can can fit in. It's important on a building like this to differentiate between the two buildings, not to make them look like one building. So I agree with the uh, with the ridge revisions. I think the windows are character defining uh, events. And when you send specifications for a window, it doesn't uh, flag that you're looking for a change in the in the overall elevation. So I'm not compelled by the applicant's argument. And, uh, and so with respect to 1311 Second Avenue North, I move uh, for uh, decision concurrent with the staff recommendations. Thank you, Vice Chair. Second by Commissioner Williams. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Thank you. This is the second violation. So we'll a little bit shorter and a little bit easier. It's one of my Broadway. Just so you're aware, since the publication of the staff report, we did receive the affidavit, so that's no longer a concern. So with this project, monitors were installed within the recessed portion of the storefront. They're kind of difficult to see in the lower photograph, but, but they are there. Um, so based on the guidelines, um, equipment should not be visible from the public right away. These are obviously highly visible to anyone walking on the street. Also, things like this should not cover character defined features. Again, they're covering transoms. So character defining should not be there. And the final issue is materials. Any new materials should be compatible, not contrasting greatly with, um, with what's there. Monitors have historically never been in storefronts. Staff has never allowed them previously. So staff finds that they are not appropriate. So staff recommends that the monitors of 105 Broadway be removed within 60 days of the commission's decision, finding that they do not meet sections 2P1, 2P2 for mechanical systems, 3G1 and 3G4 for materials, and 3L1 and 3L3 for additions. I believe the applicant is not here currently, so. Thank you, Kelly. Okay, since the applicant is not here, we will open public hearing and close public hearing. Commissioners? It seems this one is very straightforward violation. And if nobody else has comment, I move uh, one. Sure. I agree, it's straightforward, but the language, it would be maybe advisable for the language of the guidelines here to be updated to include electronic monitors. What an excellent idea. <laughs> because mechanical systems, I get it. It's This wasn't factored in. When these design guidelines were written, nobody thought people would be putting TVs on the front. Exactly. So, so in 20, just to give you a little background, I think it was 2012 or 2013. I may have that date wrong. We did try to, to do that, to revise the guidelines, and there was the property owners and business owners were not receptive at that time. But now we're hearing that they are, um, they've got their own merchants group and they're a little more cohesive and they really want to look at it again. So we're going to be starting that um, probably in July, starting that discussion with everybody. Thank you to both commissioners for bringing that up. <laughs> well, with that conclusion, uh, I move uh, in respect to 105 Broadway, I move to accept staff recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner. And second by Commissioner Price. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none. And that motion passes.
Yep, that's right. <laughs> We're back to this one, but it is the right direction. So this is a request for the replacement of two windows on the front elevation of the frame house at 1311 2nd Avenue North. As just discussed, when the commission initially reviewed this overall project in 2020, it was approved with the condition that staff would approve any window replacement. Staff visited the site in February 2023, and given the condition at the time, staff determined that most of the windows could be replaced, but that the two windows on the front elevation of the frame house were in repairable condition and should be retained and repaired as per the guidelines. So as long as I'm standing up there, I might as well explain. Um, a little bit of confusion when we discussed it a minute ago. Um, so when we came to review in 2023, those two front windows on the brick house were already missing. So at that time, and as they said, there's been a change in ownership, change in architects, change in staff. This was originally Sean's project. So it's been a lot of people trying to figure out um, where we are with this project. So when we initially looked at it, those two were already missing. We said out of what's left, these two need to remain everything else you can replace. So not understanding that two of those windows had already gone missing since the commission originally approved it. So that's, that's where that confusion came in. They were correct. We did tell them you could replace everything but these two not realizing that two had already at some point, whether it was them or the previous owner had been removed. But that, that's already been settled, but just to clarify. Okay, so this window is on the porch and has been protected from the elements. It's in good condition, two panes of glass are missing, but there's no apparent rot and both the muttons and the rails are all intact. The window on the front gable is also in good condition. There's a small amount of separation in that bottom rail, which appears to be repairable. Otherwise, the glass, muttons, and rails are all intact here as well. Staff finds that these two remaining windows are character-defining features of the house. These are distinctive architectural features with unique flat arch detailing that's difficult and prohibitively expensive to accurately replicate today. The guidelines require the repair of deteriorated architectural features whenever possible. Exterior storm windows could be added to protect the repairs made to these windows, increase energy efficiency, and decrease street noise. Windows on the brick house have a flat top with an arched piece of trim, and this is the treatment that the applicant would like to apply to the front of the frame house with new windows. Alternatively, they could use an arched window seen here, but the profile is not a good match to the historic windows. In conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the request to replace the historic windows and recommends the windows should be repaired rather than replaced as per the original preservation permit. You know, the owners are here, and I think they would like to speak again. Thank you, Jenny. Applicant, did they leave? Okay. All right, seeing no applicant, we'll open public hearing, close public hearing. Okay, commissioners. Madam Chairwoman, I, I agree with the staff recommendation that we, uh, that the, these windows are character defining and replacement windows will have a whole different type of glass and a whole different appearance. Be very hard to replicate in a new window the very narrow muttons that are part of this character divining uh, window. Uh, I, I agree with the staff recommendation, and unless other commissioners have comments, I move for uh, disapproval in accordance with the staff recommendation. Thank you, Vice Chair. Second by Commissioner Cotton. All in favor? Okay. Seeing none opposed, that motion passes. And one general comment from the chair is that I think since it's public hearing that when I think um, we're contractors, architects and such to not take for granted what has been done in whatever they've taken over. I know there's been changes of ownership and Commissioner Price has said that in the past we see these kind of um, projects where it's overlooked um, so it's a, a sort of a cautionary flag to say to those who have purchased new um, properties under historic overlay, neighborhood conservation overlays, to look at the permits that have been issued for that property so that we don't have um, these issues going forward. So just general comment. Thank you. I, I do have one additional comment too. Since the applicants left, I'm not sure they understood the difference between the two motions. So if the staff could reach out just to make sure they fully are under understanding of what the actions were, it would be great. Yeah. I Thank watched them and I thought they were sitting back down. So, oops. Um, all right, moving on. 2008 Cedar Lane. 
This is an application for the construction of a new single family house on this vacant lot in the Belmont Hillsboro Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. You may remember the commission approved an application for infill on this lot back in 2018, which was never constructed. That preservation permit has expired. However, if this proposed project presented today is not approved, that previous permit could be reissued without further discussion as the guidelines have not changed. The applicant is not requesting a zoning code variance, which would go to BCA. The one and one half story form, 30 foot 10 inch ridge and 42 foot width match the massing that the commission found to be appropriate in 2018. Staff finds that the proposed infill meets the design guidelines in terms of siting and setbacks. A driveway from the street is proposed as is typical in this neighborhood. The materials, roof shape, orientation, and proportion and rhythm of openings are all appropriate. You've received considerable public comment regarding the rhythm of spacing. The typical lot width on this block is approximately 100 feet wide. This lot was created by the applicant in 2012 prior to the overlay when he subdivided the existing 112 foot wide lot, creating two new lots, which are both significantly narrower than other lots in the context. The typical lot is nearly twice as wide as this lot and the existing houses are widely spaced. The proposed side setbacks meet the base zoning, but due to the comparatively narrow width of this lot, the rhythm of spacing on the street is disrupted. Staff finds that the width of the lot, which is a factor beyond the control of MHCC, is what disrupts the rhythm of spacing. In conclusion, staff recommends approval of the proposed infill with the following conditions, adding a walkway, finished floor height shall be consistent as typical, HVAC shall be, uh, location shall be reviewed, and materials shall be reviewed, so all standard conditions. With these conditions, staff finds that the design meets the guidelines. Um, there is a representative of the applicant. I don't think he wants to speak unless you have specific questions for him. I think we may have public comment though. Okay, thank you, Jenny. With that comment, I will open public hearing. My name is Carol Kenner. I live at 1901 Cedar Lane. I have a petition from people who live not in the 2000 block of Cedar Lane, but in the 1900 block and in the 1800 block of Cedar Lane that I would like to submit uh, in opposition to this. The average lot on Cedar Lane, and these houses were mostly built between about night from, from the 1800 block all the way to the end of the street, were mostly built between um, 19... Uh, 32 and maybe the beginning of the Second World War. All of the lots are roughly somewhere between 90 and 130 feet wide. My lot is 120 feet wide. We didn't find, uh, those of us that live on the lower part of Cedar Lane did not even find out about this until this past weekend. And so we've had to do a little hustling. Um, People on the street are very unhappy that this is happening. And we were unhappy. We didn't know that the lot had been subdivided. Uh, he has plenty of space. Mr. Smallman owns a lot, both lots. He has plenty of space to move that house to both lots and to reconnect both of those lots so that it would be in, in sync with the rest of the street. It's a wonderful, lovely street. And to have one more thing on that street that is not in simpatico is in opposition to what everybody that I've spoken to wants on our street. And the guidelines say that things need to be in simpatico and follow what is in existence for other lots. And so it's not like he can't do this. It's that he has elected not to do this. And so those are our complaints, and I hope you will hear us. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kenner. Anyone else? Council member. Hey, uh, Councilman Tom Cash, District 18. Um, I, I have heard many concerns about this, especially as it relates to two things, uh, the the rhythm of spacing and the, the um, narrowness of the lot and how those two things will mesh together to, to create, you know, to create a, a look that will fit with the rest of the street. Uh, and I understand that concern uh, and hope you can hear that concern as well. Um, I have also heard uh, numerous concerns about stormwater. Uh, I have talked to Mr. Smallman, the applicant, and I do know that he is willing to 
um, work some on uh, stormwater issues. I know that's not your your purview, but he is. Um, I don't know that he's he's willing to do everything that the neighbors uh, have approached him about. Uh, but I am willing to hold a meeting about with with Metro Stormwater um, and Mr. Smallman and neighbors to help work some of those things through. Uh, but I do hope that you'll um, listen carefully to and read carefully to the uh, neighbors' concerns about um, how they feel this doesn't fit with the, the designs on, or not designs, but spacing on some of the rest of the street, um, other houses on the rest of the street. And um, I appreciate, appreciate your work and consideration. Thank you. Thank you, council member. Always appreciate our council members when they attend. Anyone else? I'm Nan Allison. I live at 2002 Cedar Lane. My husband and I recently moved to um, Cedar Lane 2019. We lived in Green Hills in his, um, I would call a historic house, beautiful oak cottage. But we moved precisely because there was no historic zoning overlay and everything around became infill and the traffic got to be where it was really not a neighborhood anymore. Um, so I became aware of this, um, the issue relating to the um, property at 2008 Cedar last week. Um, I don't, I did not understand a lot of the guidelines. Uh, I couldn't understand from um, the Printout or the letter that we got from Mr. Smallwin alerting us to the fact of the hearing today. Um, but my neighbors uh, educated me on um, the dimensions of the lot and some of the issues. And um, I became concerned because this is a street that we moved to with the expectations that it would uh, maintain its character um, in the neighborhood. I appreciate your concerns or listening to our concerns. Thank you, Ms. Allison. Hi, my name is Scott Troxell. Um, I'm the president of Belmont Hillsboro Neighbors. Um, Belmont Hillsboro Neighbors was um, uh, basically the impetus for the overlay being started um, when it began. Um, I would ask that you please um, take a good look. I hope you've had an opportunity to read through the, the letters that have been submitted by neighbors. Um, I think they offer some very uh, relevant um, questions that, that do deserve some answers, uh, both for this property, but also because uh, subsequently you'll see 2010 Cedar certainly come before um, uh, this body as well. And it's a narrower lot and some of these same questions or concerns will still exist. So I um, so would ask that you um, uh, please consider those uh, the, the issues and the questions raised uh, by the neighbors in the letters that they have sent. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Troxell. Anyone else? Dwayne Cuthbertson, 409 Merritt Avenue. I'm here on behalf of the owner, uh, mostly just to monitor the conversation, uh, not partic uh, particularly familiar with the details in this case, but wanted to offer that uh, if in your deliberation you find at some point uh, you feel like this application does not uh, is not consistent with the design guidelines, uh, the owners ask that uh, we defer at at least one meeting uh, to work with staff on those details. So that's all I wanted to offer. Since you are speaking on behalf of the applicant, it would be the applicant to do the deferral, not the commission. So if you're asking us to do that now, that should be the time. So I'm in a little bit of a pickle because <laughs> if the commission finds it uh, uh, consistent with the design guidelines, of course, he'd like to move it forward. Um, uh, and, you know, I can't ask you what you all think right now. So okay. um, I don't want to defer it for him at, in case you all do find the application consistent with the design guidelines. Uh, but if in your deliberation... <laughs> Uh, you think this needs more work with staff, uh, he would appreciate. Okay. Well. Did you give us your name? Uh, I did. Dwayne Cuthbertson, 409 gotcha. Mary Avenue. Thank you. Yes. All right. Um, anyone else? Okay. I'll close public hearing. 
and actually applicant would have a minute. Do they have two minutes or do they have one minute left on the rebuttal? One. Oh, there's rebuttal. That was your rebuttal. Okay. <laughs> to public comment. All right. Um, okay. Close public hearing. Commissioners. Madam Chair, um, and you know, I, I read, and everybody read lots of comment from the neighbor. I think in the spirit of guideline, uh, width, uh, height, and proportion to the lot, uh, this one is, uh, I personally think, a uh, great room of, of improvement. Uh, particularly the height itself, it's within the, you know, height limit, average height limit. I think it was set uh, between 21 feet and 31 feet. So in the neighborhood, the height itself uh, uh, is somewhere between 21 and 31. Uh, this application is nearly on top of the height list uh, with 30 feet and a half. And with us is, it's not the highest because it's a 47 to 75, and you know front is 38 and back is 42. However, I think what neighbor is concerning is proportionality to the lot, because if that width is sitting on the 100 foot uh, frontage, it would be more meet with rhythm and character. So I have request or, you know, would it be so nice to uh, redesign proportionally fit, even though it may meet base zoning, a side setback and meet a front setback, but it can be uh, room for improvement to work on the width and height to more proportionally meet with uh, rhythm and character of the neighborhood. So with that, uh, if applicant is amenable to defer, I would kind of suggest deferral. Uh, that's my opinion. Uh, I'd be interested to hear other commissioner's opinion as well. Very well heard, Commissioner. This is a sort of unusual that we um, it's important to, and we'll raise the point that this is an overlay zoning, conservation zoning overlay, which means it, it goes over the existing base zoning. So we can't control the base zoning or the fact that this was a previously a single lot that's been subdivided into two. I, I personally am, am, am persuaded by the staff recommendation here that this, this house uh, is well designed, meets the, meets the setbacks, it meets the predominant height along the block. I understand change can be hard for an, uh, an established street like this, but um, until the owner or the applicant agrees to rejoin into a single lot, to me, this meets the, the, the guidelines that we're that we're here to discuss. So I'm I'm all I'm fine with the staff recommendation. Well, this is a very difficult case on a very beautiful street. Unfortunately, from what I understand, it the lot was subdivided before the overlay came in, so we had no input or control on that. Um, uh, and it meets our design guidelines. So um, I'll have to say I'm in support of the staff recommendations. Thank you, Commissioner. You know, I, I fully understand and, and appreciate the numerous letters that we have from the neighbors and understand the concern about this. I know the value of large lots and big spaces between the buildings, um, but, but we are called to adhere to the guidelines. And we, on a regular basis, deny projects that don't fit those guidelines. I don't think we have any uh, basis or jurisdiction to be able to deny a project that does meet the guidelines. I think the staff recommendation uh, finds that it meets the guidelines. I don't see things that jump out at me as being in violation of the guidelines. So as, as difficult as this is, um, 
I think that uh, I, I have to support the other commissioners that have talked about this as well. Thank you, Vice Chair. And it is important to acknowledge that the neighborhood and their community is very aware of, you know, new construction and how it affects the, the neighborhood context. So definitely we as a commissioner, commission, um, you know, uh, applaud, you know, when the association or the neighborhood is, is really, you know, got their awareness of it. So we want to acknowledge your um, comments as well. Commissioner, turn your mic on, please. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, seem like I'm in the minority here, but I'm really moved by the level of opposition to this um, to this um, nomination. I um, I don't know. While I except what staff has proposed seems as though I heard that the owner was willing to work with the people that are protesting. So I'm seeing that not only wants to abide by the guidelines, but he wants to be a good neighbor as well. And that means a lot to me. Um, I'm, I'm compelled by the opposition though, and the many forms that it's took and I'm tending to lean the other way. So I, um, I think I'm with uh, Commissioner Williams and Commissioner Johnson on this. I, having been a neighborhood association president, I know how important it is for developers and builders and associations and council people to have these conversations ahead of time before they get to this point and. I appreciate that they're willing to have that conversation. So in that, I'd like to give them that opportunity to do that. So I don't think I can support the staff recommendations here. Commissioner, that's why we are commissioners that have our reading and we hear that clearly public comments. Anyone else? I, I, I do, we'll have one other comment. The, one of the things that we have the biggest struggle with as commissioners is the requirement within the guidelines that the size of a new building and its mass in relation to open spaces be compatible by not contrasting greatly with surrounding historic buildings. Uh, every meeting we see buildings that we that are much larger than the ones that were there, but the measurements that the guidelines call for are for height and for width. Certainly the width of this building is less than most of the others. Um, the ridge height, the eave height, uh, number of stories, one and a half here. So with those yardsticks that we have to measure with, this falls within the guidelines from that standpoint. But. I think I concur with Vice, Vice Chair Stewart. I think we are given a list of guidelines and <clears throat> as we spoke, um, the lot was divided before the overlay was in, in place. So as presented, it does seem to meet the guidelines that we have set forth. Thank you, Commissioner. You know, I think for public hearing, when, when we you know, discuss and have these debates, it's really good to, to hear how, um, you know, we have our purview of our design guidelines and does it meet our guidelines? Um, and again, I think I just want to, again, recap that this was done, that there was split, bef the lot was split before the overlay. And so you have different lot sizes. We do review per um, project. So, um, and again, we do not have purview over base zoning. Um, so those are some of the main points that I'm hearing our discussion. I just wanted to add a couple of things because I know one of the public comments was, you know, that there's some questions that they have that they want answered. 
I'm pretty sure it was subdivided after the overlay was expanded. Um, but however, you don't have any say so yes. over subdivision. Um, that's the planning department. And you obviously don't have any say so over what it could be or should be or whether or not he should combine them or not, not, not within your purview. Um, in 2018, I believe it was, um, a similar sized house was approved by the commission, at least in terms of width. Um, there was also some comments that this required uh, BZA action because it was a variance that's being requested. There is no request for a variance to the code. This is simply you applying the design guidelines. And as you've all heard me say a million times, that's why the nine of you exist is because these aren't hard and fast rules. They are guidelines that allow you to address every property based on its unique conditions. So what would be ideal is that this lot was 100 feet wide, but it's not. And so you, your role is to apply the guidelines on a 50 foot wide lot. Thank you, Ms. Ziegler. Any other comments? And just so we're double clear, there is a previously approved host home that could be built tomorrow, even if we deny this application. Thank you. With all of that said, I'm ready to make a motion. If anyone Go, Commissioner. Uh, Madam Chair, with respect to 2008 Cedar Lane, I move for approval with the staff recommendation and, and with uh, the conditions applied. Right. Seconded by the vice chair. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have a raise of hands for who is for the motion. Please raise your hand. And who is opposed to the motion? There are three. Concurring, four. So the vote is passed, correct? You have four votes. We have four votes. So the motion passes. All right. Thank you, commissioners, for your comments. All right. The house at 2803 Woodlawn Drive is a circa 1925 Tudor revival that contributes to the historic character of the Hillsborough West End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Um, here are photos of the front and the left side. The two-story outbuilding at the rear um, was constructed prior to the overlay. This request is, um, is to construct dormer additions on the sides of the historic house and includes a request for partial demolition to change that rear uh, hipped roof form to a gabled roof form. Um, so several design criteria um, are included in the design guidelines to help ensure that side dormers are appropriately scaled uh, for the historic house, including the placement of the dormer, roof form, size, glazing, and materials. The proposed side dormers are approximately 14 feet wide. The design guidelines state that the number of dormers and their location and size should be appropriate to the style and design of the building and that sometimes dormer locations relate to openings below. Uh, given the modest one and one half story scale of the historic house, as well as the prevalence of, of paired openings um, on the first level, uh, staff finds that the width of the proposed dormers does not meet the guidelines. Uh, wider dormers often um, increases the perceived scale uh, from one and a half to closer to two stories. Um, to more of a two-story addition. Uh, staff finds that that is the case um, here uh, and would recommend that the dormers not exceed approximately six feet uh, in width each, which is uh, approximately the, the width of the paired window openings um, on the walls below. The dormers are proposed to have a flat roof form with a pitch of one over 12. Um, per the design guidelines, the roof pitch of side dormers should generally match that of the roof of the historic house. Um, staff would recommend a minimum pitch of 412, which while is still less than that of the historic house would be more appropriate, uh, could be appropriate for a dormer. Um, with regard to placement of the dormers, the, the guidelines uh, requires that the dormers be inset at least two feet from the ridge uh, the wall below and the side wall, so which would be the rear wall here. Uh, as proposed, this meets 
two of those. The applicant is requesting uh, that the dormers sit only one foot off the ridge, um, which staff could finds could be appropriate given uh, the low height of the historic house, um, as well as the requirement for uh, more of a pitched roof. Um, given those factors, staff finds that the one foot insect could be appropriate in this case. Um, so to mitigate the perceived width the, um, of the side dormers, the applicant proposes to replace the existing rear hip roof form uh, with a gabled form. The historic house has a cross gable roof form with a hip component at the rear. Um, prior to the overlay, um, this um, gabled rear dormer was added, but you can see that the hip roof form still remains. Um, the roof form of a historic house is considered to be a character defining feature and demolition um, would not meet the design guidelines. Uh, in this case, there's no evidence that that hip roof form is not original to the house. Um, and also staff finds that the proposal does not meet the design guideline that specifically states that uh, the addition of side dormers um, that would require the removal of a historic feature um, is not appropriate. So, and just to clarify, the, these guidelines are for dormer additions to the side walls of historic house. So not to dormer additions or to dormers to additions to historic houses. So in this case, it would be on the historic house. So just just to emphasize that and clarify that um, because they're, the guidelines are a little different than we would normally look at for an addition. Um, and in conclusion, staff recommends disapproval of the partial, de partial demolition of, of that reform and approval of the side dormer additions with the following conditions. Uh, one, that the width, width of the side dormers be approximately six feet wide. Uh, two, the dormer roof pitches be at least 412. And three, the final selections for the windows, roofing material, and roof shingle color be approved prior to purchase installation. Um, I'm here for questions. The applicant is here as well. I, I do have a question for you. Sure. Uh, taking the dormers down to six feet, mm. would it be, um, what would the staff's consideration be of that being a gabled structure versus shed type? I, I think either could be appropriate in this case. Um, and also it's, I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine because it wasn't something that we've seen proposed, but, um, you know, assuming the rear hip to four roof form were kept, um, it might be possible to get two smaller dormers. Um, I don't know if that would get closer to meeting the, the applicant's goals. Do you mean two smaller side by side? Correct. Yeah, not attached, but we, that's something that we frequently see where you detach them, maybe they're not as wide. So if you had two smaller six foot dormers. Two smaller six foot dormers, you'd be talking about at least a 12 foot mass. Right, uh, there again, we haven't seen that. So I don't know if it could meet all of the insets. It was just, it was something that was suggested and this is what the applicant wanted to request. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Anyone else have questions for Melissa? Okay, thank you, Melissa. Sure. Up again. Okay, so I'm just going to advance it up here. Great, thank you. Hi, I'm Cameron Culver. Thank you all for having me and uh, for all the work that you guys do. Um, this is my home, as you can see, 2803 Woodlawn. Uh, the addition upstairs is the primary bedroom. So with with the current layout, it is only a two bedroom house. This is uh, an effort to create a larger primary bedroom upstairs. Um, so I, there are three main issues that I, I, we should go over um, as far as just the objective of, of why uh, my architect and designer drew it out the way that he did. Um, so number one, the single dormer on both sides instead of two doubles. Um, the main purpose for that is just because it, it is enlarging the room significantly. So if we were to have two dormers instead of one, you would have two spaces with, you know, larger ceiling heights, and then you'd have a, a place in the middle on both sides, which would significantly 
uh, you know, in, in my opinion, it would significantly downplay the, the benefit of putting in the dormers. Um, because they are on the side and they're not visible from the front, um, and they are also sitting below the ridge of the house, I'm hopeful that uh, there will be consideration on just the, the logic behind doing one dormer instead of two. Uh, the second point being the height of the dormers. Um, the goal with wanting that to be slightly higher than the staff recommendation of two feet below is just trying to keep the dormer above eight feet at its lowest point. Um, my contractor advised that uh, if we sit down two feet from the ridge of the the top ridge of the house, that the ceiling heights in in those locations at their lowest point would, would only be a little over seven feet. Um, <clears throat> so if they were willing to work with us to meet in the middle on that, then that would create a uh, slightly over eight foot uh, ceiling height, which is more practical. Um, and then point number three is the uh, change of the rear roof line from the hip to the gable and the thought process behind that is just that it creates a proper landing at the stair um, when you're going up the stair I ideally would like to have um, a more proper standard hallway size and that would give us the ability to do that so um, with that said I did I did put together just a little presentation so this again is the side of the house um, because of the size. I think it's hard to imagine two different six foot dormer windows um, on on the side there. And these are the drawing elevations which you've seen on the west side of the house. It's not visible at all. Um, and on the east side of the house, it's only visible if you're standing at a you know severe angle like you see here. Um, and then I just took some pictures of some similar dormers on houses in the neighborhood um, that are also in the historic overlay. And I, again, I've, I've learned a lot during this meeting. So these may have been done prior to the historic overlay being in place. But uh, this is 2702 Fairfax. Um, a larger dormer window on the original structure. This is 2111 Natchez Trace, um, also a dormer that's visible from the side that attaches to the top peak. Uh, this one you can't see very well, um, but it is 2520 Fairfax, and it has a larger dormer um, on the side. And then lastly, Looks like those are the only three I got in. Um, lastly, I also understand that now this is an this is not an original structure, but it is very similar in, to, in design to what I envisioned the dormers being on both sides of my house, which I think is very tasteful and and accentuates the original design and character, which is why I bought the house um, because I love that and I wouldn't. Uh, want to change that. But this is a good example of what I envision the windows and the scale of the dormers being. But you can see here, it also connects to the top um, ridge. So if I can connect to the top ridge, then it could be a, uh, and I apologize, I don't have the correct terminology, but the slanted dormer versus the flat. The flat was in an effort to maintain that ceiling height. Um, while working with the, the recommendations from staff. So that is all I've got. Thank you. Thank you. Do you have any questions for the applicant? Okay. Seeing none for the moment. All right. Uh, public hearing is open and closed. Commissioners. Uh, the funny little rear dormer that that was an addition a, a non-historic addition correct uh which was in one of his examples no ah. on the original house um on the back yeah that was that was done prior to the overlay right 
as was the L building. Okay, thank you. Sure. May I ask a little technical question to the staff? Uh, so it was suggested, you know, to separate our DOMA, but if we were to consider, you know, uh, just one single DOMA, is the six feet will be the maximum you would recommend without going into, you know, uh, disturbing the original roof line, or could it be a little bit larger than six feet? Um, I think that's for you to determine. Um, we based, uh, staff based that measurement off of the width of the window opening below, um, just based on the language of the, the guidelines, which, um, which again, are guidelines. So uh, it, guidance would be appreciated. <laughs> I think it, this is a case in which I'm I'm uh, persuaded to allow the applicant some um, leeway to build a dormer close to what he's, if not exactly close to what he's proposing. Uh, this is a, as it says in the guidelines, a good way to add upper story room. Um, and also he's, he's not asking for an, a big addition, which we often, I think would often have bigger impacts on original historic homes like this than what I considered this to be kind of a modest uh, uh, way of adding square feet without an, a larger addition. Um, I appreciate the analysis that Melissa put into figuring out six feet, uh, but also with the possibility of two six foot ones, you're already dealing with 12 foot mass on the roof. Um, I agree with the analysis on that the slope should be closer to historic slope of the roof rather than flat. And this is for the applicant's sake. Uh, we try to find middle ground when, when possible. And um, I think I think we're on that going down on that direction. But considering he's not asking for a big addition, this is a way of adding square footage um, that is a historic method of doing so. Uh, I'm willing to hear other voices and um, but I'm, I'm, I'm kind of persuaded to, to figure out something to let him find something close to what he's proposing. Thank you, Commissioner. Here. I am uh, kind of same boat as uh, Commissioner Price. Uh, my concern is I uh, definitely don't want to uh, encourage uh, partial demolition. So that's why I asked if uh, we allow 14 feet uh, DOMA as presented, uh, would it possible to achieve it without demolishing existing historical roof? So that would be that one of the conditions. So if uh, 14 feet will disturb uh, the roof line, uh, need to be come down like a foot or two. So I would be persuaded with, you know, DOMA larger than six feet, but definitely uh, keep the condition number one. And uh, number two, I do agree with the pitch uh, roof other than flat. And I think only thing is uh, the width. It's 14 feet is okay, but uh, as long as it can achieve uh, not a demolition at the roof line. Okay. I think I concur with a lot of these comments, um, and I'll see if I can put it into a motion that we can further discuss if we need to. Uh, so with respect to 2803 Woodlawn Drive, I move for um, the disapproval of the partial demolition of the hip roof on the back, but approval of the side dormer additions uh, with, the accept, with the staff conditions except uh, accepting condition one. And um, I think it was also said that, uh, that they thought it could be acceptable to have it within one foot of the ridge as opposed to two feet from the ridge. So I would move forward. Th that's correct. Although I heard that the applicant was asking to actually not have any inset from the ridge. Like, that would be a preference. But staff found it to be appropriate to have one foot. Uh, and, and so okay. one with it being not closer to the ridge than one foot. So. And also 
Brooks Moore script about that it would not disturb the historical roof line. Uh, I think curve. that's I think that's what that's what Given. number one. That's that's the hip roof on the back. Okay. So. Just want to make that clear as well. All right. There's a motion. There's a second by Commissioner Johnson. All in favor? Okay. Seeing none opposed, that motion passes. Okay. Thank you, applicant. Fourteen sixteen Forest Avenue is a circa 1982 frame house that does not contribute to the historic character of Lachlan Springs. Uh, MHCC staff issued an administrative permit for the structure's demolition in June of 2023. The applicant is proposing new infill uh, for the lot. I'm just, I'd just like to start with some context photos. So on the top, you can kind of see the little one-story house, which is the site um, among one and one and a half story historic houses. Um, the bottom photo are, photo, photo are houses that are kind of further down the street to the east on that same side of the street. Um, and then houses a little bit to the west, uh, um, just on the other side of the lot. And then the bottom photo are houses from across the street. So the house, you know, the neighborhood is pretty much consistent, one, one and a half story. Uh, here's the site plan. The applicant uh, is proposing a structure that meets all the base zoning setbacks. The front setback uh, staff finds to be appropriate, to kind of in between the two front setbacks on either side. The um, outbuilding that you see is marked as a future DADU, so it's not part of this application. Most likely it will come back as a, an administrative permit, but if not, it'll come back to you. So uh, here is the front facade. Um, overall, staff finds that the height of about uh, 24 feet and a width of a primary width of 32 feet, which does exclude the bays, um, meets the historic context. Um, here are the side elevations. There is quite a bit of grade here. So um, the structure gains a basement level uh, and there is a basement level garage uh, at the rear, which meets the design guidelines when there's grade like this. Um, but overall staff finds that the um, Height, scale, design, materials, roof form, orientation, all of you know, that it meets all of the design guidelines. Um, so staff is recommending approval with our standard conditions. Um, the applicant is here. Uh, he's in agreement with the staff recommendation. And unless you need want to speak to him, he's fine not saying anything. So. <laughs> well said. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to open public hearing. Close public hearing. Commissioners, this should be a smooth one. Madam Chairman, with respect to 1416 Forest Avenue, I move for approval with staff conditions. The motion. <laughs> flip, a co flip a coin on who's done the second. I'm, Commissioner Mayhall. All right. Uh, all in favor of the motion. Okay. Seeing none opposed, that motion passes. Thank you. We can laugh sometimes, you know. Next up is 3801 Princeton Avenue. Um, it's a circa 1950s frame house that does not contribute to the historic character of the Richland West End neighborhood because of its state of construction. So this does look like it's a historic house, get that. Um, but um, the Sanborn maps show that it was constructed sometime after 1951, between 1951 and 1957, which is beyond the um, period of significance for the Richland West End neighborhood. Um, so therefore it is not contributing and staff has issued an administrative permit for its demolition. Um, again, starting with some context photos, the top photo is on the left with all the trees, the um, house that's to be demolished, and then on the right is the historic house next door, and then kind of houses further down to the right on Princeton Avenue. Um, the top photo are, photo are houses across the street. Uh, the trees were not in my favor, but uh, the <laughs> bottom structure beyond the trees, which is great, love trees, is the uh, house that's across Craighead from 3801 Princeton, because Princeton, 3801 Princeton is on a corner lot, so it's the corner of Craighead Avenue. Uh, here is the site plan. Um, the project meets all the base zoning setbacks, and again, the infill's front setback lines up with the front setback of the house next door at uh, 3803 Princeton Avenue. Um, 
One thing is that the um, site has an existing parking pad mid lot off of Christopher Street. Um, the design guidelines state, I'm sorry, I said Craighead earlier, it's actually Christopher Street, so I apologize about that. Um, the design guidelines state that parking should be located off the alley when there is an alley. Staff therefore recommends that the existing parking off of Christopher Street be removed with the development of the new info. The applicant proposes a one and a half story infill house with a, with a one story side porch extension. Um, this form is found in several houses in nearby um, the next door at 3083. They have a small one, one kind of one story porch extension. Um, so staff finds that that definitely meets the historic context. Uh, the overall height is 24 feet at the front and overall staff finds that the infills height, width and scale are appropriate for the historic context and meet the design guidelines. Here are the side elevations. Uh, the bottom one is, or no, I'm sorry, the top one is the one that faces Christopher Street. Um, so in conclusion, uh, staff recommends approval with our you know, standard conditions, plus with the condition that the existing side parking off of Christopher Street be removed and that all parking be located at the rear accessed via the alley. Questions to Melissa? Okay, thank you. Applicant. And the applicant series. Mm -hmm. Right on time. Is it on? Okay. Um, I'll answer any questions you have. Um, the clients have on the house. Who might you be, sir? Oh. <laughs> My name's Van Pond. I'm the architect for uh, David and Lauren Harper, who own this property and have, are currently. It's currently rental property for them. They live on Cambridge Avenue. So they are neighbors of neighbors. Um, the only thing that I would ask for your consideration on is retention of the existing side street parking, which has been in place for at least 30 years. So it's not a new, um, it's not, a, it's not a, a new introduction and we are not asking to expand it. And actually staff's first commentary came back and said, we'd rather you not expand the parking and the final commentary came back and we'd like it gone. Um, so the owners have asked me to ask for your consideration in maintaining that as it is not a difference in uh, configuration or use of the lot. That is what I have and if you have questions otherwise I will be happy to answer them. Anyone? Uh, Mr. Pond, can you tell us what the use of the alley is planned on being in the back? I mean, it looks to me like the yard goes all the way back to the alley. The yard goes all the way back to the alley. It's completely fenced in. It has been for at least eight years since the previous owners. They didn't. They didn't do this fence. They they bought the house. Um, the fence has been there. Goodness, at least eight years. Um, so they really just want to maintain as much backyard as they can. They have two young children. Very pretty pretty reasonable thing. And there's actually a. I don't think it shows. I don't think we have a picture that shows this. But directly across the alley is a detached accessory structure that is at minimal setback. So it's one of those they'd really like to kind of keep their depth and their barrier, if possible. Okay. Any questions? Heather, thank you. Thank you. Hang around for a minute. Okay, open public hearing. Close public hearing. Commissioners? I understand the staff recommendation for requesting the removal of the parking pad because um, it, it, it is in the guidelines. I kind of feel like the spirit of that guideline, though, is for an entirely new build uh, with parking. And because this is pre-existing with an existing curb cut, I'm inclined to let them keep it in this in this case. Um, maybe not if it was an entirely new build and putting in a new side parking lot. No, because the guideline says keep it at the back. But in this case, I'm all right with it. Madam Chairman, I, I agree with Commissioner, and uh, unless there are other comments, I'll um, make a motion that with respect to 3801 Princeton Avenue, we approve this project uh, with staff recommendations with the exception of uh, number two uh, requiring the relocation of the parking. In, because it's been existing. Okay. All right. There's a second. All in favor? Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, one more infill. This is an application for the construction of a new single family house on this vacant lot at 188 Kenner in the Kenner Manor Neighborhood Conservation Zone in Overlay. The context here is one and one and a half story houses. Staff finds that the proposed infill meets the design guidelines in terms of siting and setbacks. A driveway from the street is proposed, which is typical in this neighborhood. In terms of height, width, and overall massing, staff finds that the design meets the design guidelines. Staff has some concerns about the foundation height. We're concerned it may grow in the field as we are commonly told by contractors that they need a block or two of foundation above grade. So you can see in the back, which on top is the left and the bottom is the right, um, the foundation comes very close to being right at grade. Um, so the height as proposed is already at the maximum end of what would be appropriate in this context. So staff suggests adding a condition that the overall height from grade at the front shall not increase. That way if a taller foundation is needed, adjustments should be made to the design so that the overall height doesn't increase. Otherwise, staff finds that the project meets the design guidelines in terms of materials, roof form, orientation, and proportion and rhythm of openings. In conclusion, we recommend approval of the proposed infill with the standard conditions and the condition that the overall height of the house as measured from the highest point of existing grade at the front shall not exceed 26 feet. The applicant is here, I believe, and would like to speak. No, you're good. They don't need to speak. Okay. Do you have questions for All me? All right, you make it easy on us. Questions Thank for me? Thank you. Uh, commissioners? Okay. All right. Thank you. Open public hearing and close public hearing. Well, it seems like um, that, that the applicant agrees with staff recommendations, so I'd like to uh, make a motion to approve um, 188 Kenner Avenue, the staff recommendations on that property. There's a motion. Second. There's a second by Commissioner Cotton. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Seeing none, that motion passes. Thank you. Okay, I think, Ms. Ziegler, are you heading that one? Yes. Okay. Next up is a recommendation to revise the Second Avenue design guidelines to potentially allow for taller rooftop additions in some cases. It's essentially if you can hide it, you can have it type of suggestion. What we're proposing is to continue to allow a one story rooftop addition for any property in the overlay as the design guidelines currently allow, so not changing that, and allow for another story or two if it can be accomplished in a manner that it's hidden from across the street. So on the east side of First Avenue, it would be highly visible because you have views from the opposite side of the river and from the bridge. But we thought this might be a possibility despite that visibility because it would be from such a distance and the First Avenue side is really the working side of these buildings, which is where the goods were unloaded from the river. And it's really the second avenue that's the more high style for um, merchants and shoppers. The Park Service, National Park Service, put together a preservation brief for additions that does include rooftop additions. And so it provides the following guidance. Preserve historic materials, features, and forms, which isn't an issue here because they're flat roofs, so nothing needs to be removed. That it be minimally visible, and that is the goal of the proposed language that it be compatible but differentiated. That's already part of the guidelines. We're not recommending a change to that. Should step back at least one bay. That's already part of the guidelines. No change recommended. That they generally should not be added to buildings of three stories or less, um, but we already allow them because the guidelines were written before this brief was written. So we're not trying to go backwards and change things. Additions should generally not be more than one story. Um, and that it realistically is probably what most of the buildings will get. Um, but again, those east side buildings are so deep, they're likely to be able to add some additions without it being seen. And then this is just to kind of give you an idea. This is um, this, the river side. So you can see that it was the working side. You can kind of see the view from the river, how visible it will be. And then I just want to give you this example. This is on 3rd Avenue. It's not in the overlay. It didn't come to you. But it's essentially a two-story rooftop addition. But you can see it's stepped back so far, it's unlikely that it will ever be seen from the street. So we recommend approval. Robin, I've got a question for you, please. Um, 
I did get a notice of this being a contiguous property owner. Do I, am I allowed to vote on this or do I need to recuse myself? Yes, you received notice because you are in what we call the buffer area. So in addition to everyone that's in the boundaries of the overlay, um, we have to notice outside the overlay. So that's where your property is, it's outside. So you're not directly affected by this. Great. So could we go back to the section, the last section you just had? So, um, so here you're, you're showing a setback from, if we're assuming we're looking at this section looking north, then 2nd Avenue would be on the left. There'd be no change to the existing side, but on the right-hand side is the river side. And it looks like this is a two-story addition to the historic facade without any setback on that facade. It, it, we're not recommending that this, it was just an example of how someone accomplished some additional sure. height in a spot where you won't see it. So this is on 3rd Avenue. They don't have, um, they're backed up to an alley, so they don't have a view from the back. Sure. It, it was just something that came through recently, and I thought I'd throw it in as an example. I, I guess my question is, do we want you know, up to a two-story addition at the same plane as the historic faces on First Avenue? It wouldn't be. There's already step-back requirements from First Avenue, Second Avenue, and from Cross Streets. So we're not proposing a change to that at all. What's a step-back? Uh, that the wall has to step back what, from. What is the step-back? Uh, it's 30 feet from Second Avenue. I think it's... 20 from first and 10 from across street, but don't, I can't swear to that. I may have misremembered those numbers. That's good. That's good. So then we already allow this, but this is new, new official guidelines. You already allow for rooftop additions. Right. On second Avenue. On second Avenue. Um, and actually I've got it here. Um, with a 30 foot step back from second Avenue, a 10 foot step back from first Avenue, and a 20 foot step back from um, from a cross street, a secondary street. Mm -hmm. So you already allow for one story, this would be visible or not. Mm -hmm. But this would give the potential for two to three more stories, total of three stories, if they can accomplish it in a way where it's invisible. How, uh, how will visibility be determined? The, and that's in the guidelines. Uh, railing should be, no, sorry. I mean, will there be, will there be you should have models that will come to us that we'll see um, or actually, just, simulations? To realize a rooftop addition beyond one story, the applicant shall construct a rough temporary, temporary full size or skeletal mock-up of the portion of the proposed addition that is closest to 2nd Avenue North and for the buildings on the east side of the street, also 1st Avenue North, for the commission's review. So they have to actually build a physical model? Of, of at least those two walls. Just the framing of it. Yeah. The, the one concern, sort of the flag for me, is the word generally. It, it seems to me that if we say generally, you know, typically we'll get a lot of requests for non-generally. And so <laughs> is there, a, do you think that's the appropriate word in there is generally? Or? Which generally there or all of them? them. Yeah. And which page, please? I'm sorry, go back to which screen? The, where the wording is for what we're the numbered items. The numbered items. Oh, I, I didn't put those in the, all the different, the they, guidelines. They were just, they were just uh, you, you had them up, up, up a little bit earlier. There. The, there it is. Oh, that's the, that's not the language. Oh. That's the park service. The generally should not be added to buildings of three stories or less. Generally should not be more than one story. And that's from the Park Service. Right. Okay. That's that's just the guidance we used to come up with the language we have. Okay. So where did you say generally, Vice Chair? No, just just on this. Okay. Just want to make clear. I think the new guideline language is uh, quite tight and because it's not changing side setback and, you know, uh, front setback, back setback, and it is uh, quite a uh, tight guideline. So it's up to applicant to convince if the additional height is visible or not. 
And if it's visible, uh, it's for us to deny the application based on the guideline. So I think a uh, newly updated guideline meets uh, needs and, you know, new uh, request. So I, I, I'm support of the uh, updated guideline. Would you like to open the public hearing before you continue discussion? Oh, we asked you the questions. Okay, we dove right in. Um, all right, open public hearing. Welcome. Catherine Rogers, I'm a representative. Um, you need to turn your mic on, please. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, Catherine Rogers, I'm a representative of Icon Entertainment Group. Um, I just wanted to confirm that this, these guidelines are not retroactive. Um, they're not, and that they only apply to... That's correct. They're not retroactive. Okay. So she's referencing um, actually a project on 3rd Avenue. Mm -hmm. So this would only be for 2nd Avenue. Okay, good. Yeah. So only... And historic buildings, correct? Yes. No additional buildings. It, there's yeah, right okay D on second avenue yes okay so only north. second avenue first avenue second avenue north okay so some of those buildings stretch from second to first right. i don't think they own any property in the second avenue north no yes. yeah okay so it's just second avenue north mm -hmm. icon they own property on second avenue. what property are you referring to commissioner you're don't the, don't does an icon own the McFadden's building? No, I don't think so. Because I thought that that I'm not aware of every y'all brought a property. case to us on okay. that, and the person who was talking about it said we just want to do a little something different on Second Avenue. I mean, if you work for Icon, you you know. <laughs> but I had heard that that that. Um, Mr. Miller owns a property on 2nd Avenue. Yeah, I'm an attorney here on behalf of them. Um, not aware of every property they own, but they did want me to confirm that this was not applying to 1st um, or 3rd. It is 1st. It is, does apply it to 1st. It does apply Because 2nd okay. Avenue and 1st Avenue, the buildings span that block. So right. whatever happens on 2nd, it, it, it's 1st. Okay. Okay. And, and, and I will have to say that, that, that I'm probably 90% confident that Icon Make owns sense. a building on 2nd Avenue, unless they've sold it recently. Okay. Um, okay. Um, and then also, it's just not retroactive. That's all we wanted to confirm. Okay. You got confirmed. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Anyone else? Hi, y'all. Um, I'm Kristen. I'm with Ron, and um, we uh, work together. your last name? Oh, Kristen Carson. Thank you. Hi. What, what's the last name again? Carson. Carson? Yeah, okay. hi. Hi. Um, we are, we own the um, old hostel, Dayuma, um, that's on 2nd Ave. Um, we are af actively working on submitting documents to repair the bombing. Um, so I, I assume, actually, I've talked to Robin several times already. Um, we will be doing a historic remodel, but um, we have a wing portion of the building, and then we have a square that does approach First Ave. Um, and this is something we're actively working on. Um, you know, for us, I think this would be wonderful because we're already having to do so much to the structure of the building um, that we weren't expecting to have to do. There's so much cost going into that to repair the structural damage. So, <clears throat> you know, for us, we have a situation on set where our building on 2nd Ave is about a, um, a story above the building on 1st Ave. So we're planning on building the building on 1st Ave up and then going a little bit higher for an addition there. Mm -hmm. um, totally set back within all the setback boundaries, but the additional one and a half effectively stories would enable us to make it kind of level with the with the 2nd Ave. So, um, for us, I think this would be really wonderful. I think, you know, like I said, there's already so much expense going into rebuilding the structure. A lot of that isn't covered by insurance. So mm -hmm. to have the ability to potentially recoup some of that expense is really wonderful and something I'd love for you guys to consider. That will probably come before us. So 
Maybe. Okay. <laughs> Hello, uh, my name is my name is Ron Lim. I own the property on the corner at the First Avenue North and Church Street since 2011. Uh, we operated a uh, operated a hostel in that building until the bombing of 2020. Um, Kristen Carson and I partnered on putting in a new development there as a boutique hotel. Um, one clarification that I would like to have is the visibility from the street side, as you're aware, um, that First Avenue from the Broadway to Church, Church Street slopes upward. So uh, when you say visible from the street level, like if you were to walk up to the Bank Street, I mean, you can pretty much see the whole uh, the building. So, you know, how you define that visibility from street side pending that sloping issue um, would be really helpful in terms of designing and what is allowed. So, and thank you for working with us. Um, that 2020 Christmas Day bombing has been devasta devastating for us as a both business owner and property owner and dealing with the insurance company has been something else. So um, any support that we get from the commission and, and the history, people will be really great, gratefully, uh, greatly appreciated. Thank you. We thank you. It's been a long journey and continuing. Any other comments? Are there any other comments? Yes, I have some comments. Um, yeah. Yeah, I've been working down on Second Avenue for my entire uh, career, uh, and so I'm very, you know, my heart is is there, and I'm I'm right on Third and Church, so I was down there with the bombing as well. I, you know, they 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 built these additions on Butler's Run that totally changed the facade of the back of First Avenue, and. After that was done, we got the overlay in so no one else could do it. And um, if you say, I agree with you, what does that mean if it's visible from the street? If you're on 2nd Avenue, those buildings are so tall, you could probably build six stories on top of that if you set it back enough and not see it from 2nd Avenue. Um, I happen to adore the view of 1st Avenue from across the river. Uh, I also want to uh, give you know, the property owners down there, some leeway because of what we've been through, what you've personally been through. Um, I tend to have a little problem with the generally, not more than one story and it possibly going up to three. I just have, uh, I have a, 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 a difficulty with leaving it so open. So, awesome. you know, my opinion on, on this design guideline is to, if possible, limit it to two stories. Thank you, Commissioner. And I am going to close the public hearing. <laughs> we, we would jump into it. No, 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 no worries. Um, I think we sometimes we get when a presentation like this happens, we're not always sure if there's open public hearings. So um, well said. Um, yeah, okay. Um, commissioner's comments are acknowledged. Any other questions? Uh, comments, really? Um, we're back to generally, generally. I have to say, I, I totally agree with, with Elizabeth on this. Um, if we say generally, or if two stories are allowed, everybody's going to propose two stories, uh, and we're going to end up with even more Frankenstein buildings on second Avenue than we already have. Um, and I also usually see the view from the pedestrian bridge or from the stadium side of the river. And I I can't say I'm real comfortable with this right now. Um, that's all I got right for now. Robin, tell us again what we have normally seen now. So, you know, so that we can be really clear on what a change would look like. Okay. So what the, the guidelines say right now is rooftop addition should not exceed one story in height or 15 feet. And they should be stepped back a minimum of 30 feet from 2nd Avenue. 10 feet from First Avenue and 20 feet from a secondary street if it's on a corner, if it's a corner building. That's all it says right now. So our thought was to add 
additional full or partial stories may be possible if they meet all the other design guidelines and are also designed and located to be invisible from any point across the street on 2nd Avenue North and from across the street on 1st Avenue North for buildings on the east side of the street. So that means, again, you would see it from across the river, you would see it from across the bridge, but we'd be looking at any location across the street. To realize a rooftop addition beyond the one story, which there is already allowed, the applicant shall construct a rough temporary full size or skeletal mock-up of the portion of the proposed addition that is closest to 2nd Avenue North, and for those buildings on the east side of the street, also 1st Avenue North for the commission's review. In no instance shall a rooftop addition exceed three stories. Yeah, I, I think I'm, I'm still uncomfortable because the visibility is tied from 2nd and 1st Avenue rather than a wider. I, I'm, like I say, the view shed from, from other areas is just as important as the view shed from those narrow, narrowly defined spots. How about that comment from Commissioner Price? I don't read uh, as uh, Commissioner Price or Commissioner Meho because the language is very specific. It does not say generally. So it is specifying setback, side setback, front setback, and it says, clearly it says, Direct us to which number, Commissioner? Number five. Yeah, section five. The guideline section five clearly says all the side of setback and uh, front setback, it has not changed. And it says additional full or partial story may be possible if. So that is uh, based on the applicants has to prove to us if it's possible to have additional uh, one story, or in, in any case, it would be set to maximum full three, three stories, the maximum, and which cannot be, possibly cannot be done based on visibility and uh, based on, you know, markup. So I think the condition is quite tight and it literally does not say generally <laughs> in this. Yeah. No, so the design guideline is uh, analysis may say generally, but actual guideline language does not include generally, rather a very airtight. So I'm comfortable with uh, accepting uh, the revision with that sense. I recognize that the word generally is not in here. I still am not comfortable with the view shed being defined only from second right. and first Avenue. That's the I think that it should, we should also take into consideration further, further vantage points that I and so many people, uh, see second Avenue from I, because an applicant could show that a three story tower in the middle of some building is not visible from there, but what's it going to look like? from the pedestrian bridge or or a row of towers that are not visible i i don't know it's it's a little abstract right now um and, and i guess i follow you does it change the historical view con, you know considerably if you're looking at it from a vantage point of the bridge and when you look at the vantage of it now are you thinking that way that it, it really is significant change to the historical context. I, just, yeah. I think so. And we already see the envelope being pushed on rooftop additions all the time. Um, what, what unintended consequences are we going to deal with um, on this? So Robin, can you explain the, the logic behind three stories. I mean, I, I know we've talked about one story and two, but three stories seems to be a lot for the buildings on Second Avenue. That's partly what I thought anyone could do. I kind of doubt anyone could do more than that. 
Um, but also because, again, from as Commissioner Price was talking about, the view from First Avenue could potentially look like four stories because those roof slopes fall from second to first. So you're gaining more wall height on the back. And so they, they will be very, very visible. My only thought is, this is, you know, if we do this now, are we just pushing this off on ourselves every time this comes before us to have to figure this out? <laughs> I, I guess th there's some comfort in knowing that they, if they want a three-story addition, they have to build the skeleton of it first, and we can then say no, but I kind of don't want to put us in that position to say no after, because that would be a considerable expense. And yeah. um, is could you add a couple comments then on the context for where this is coming from? Is it in, entirely has to do with the Second Avenue rebuilding and property owners are pushing for this or? There, over the years, there have been multiple property owners asking for more than one. You have approved a one and a half a few years ago. Um, you can't really see that one. Um, yeah, and so there's requests down the line, too. I don't know that there's a request for three stories. Again, we were just thinking about what's the most that might be possible. <laughs> Right. You know, my experience with construction is that uh, it's awfully hard to build one store to economically justify the building of one story addition. So I think two is appropriate. I'm just a little uncomfortable with three. So. And you've been involved with the Second Avenue reconstruction effort to some extent. Have, have you, has there been discussion of this? Uh, around the existing guidelines. Yeah. You know, I can appreciate the cautionary comments because, you know, this board changes as well. So how a commissioner will view that, you know, we're, we're looking to the future as well because these, these guidelines tend to, to be in place for a few more years. So I think that's probably our, you know, that we should think about that too is how we will look at it later on. And we do tend to push the envelope. I mean, not us but merchants and builders and developers um, always give us more time than to look at it. So I appreciate the, the thought through and, and vice chair, I, you know, if we're gonna feel better about it today, uh, two stories and you have been involved in the second Avenue uh, rebuild, um, I wonder, I hope you don't mind if we're taking a cautious, cautious approach. It would help. I'm a visual learner. Um, Me too. I wonder if we could keep talking about this maybe at the next meeting and could there be some, some mock-ups made of like what potentially might, this might look like? Um, I'm not an architect or a designer, <laughs> but we do have two on staff, so I will. Do you think you could? Yeah. <laughs> Which would, it would be a request. Okay, that sounds you know, like a like a, a, a view shed or a visual simulation of some kind. And even what if every property owner down there all of a sudden wants three stories? What would that look like? Um, <laughs> there, there's already there's articles written years ago that Second Avenue is no longer eligible for the National Register because of because of all of the changes. Do we really want to open floodgates more for that? Um, I'm not sure I do. Well said. I like that idea. But I think by the same token, we really do want to uh, do what we can to encourage the redevelopment and rebuilding of the existing sure. buildings. So and work with the existing owners. We, we know they've been through an awful, awful lot. So we'd like to see that uh, come back strong. I, I think the other question that I'd like for us to look at in this intervening time is uh, we're talking about mechanical equipment on top of the rooftop additions. And uh, we don't have any requirement for screening of that mechanical equipment, do we? We haven't. Um, 
mainly because it does tend to start looking like yet another story. So in the past, the way we've looked at it, especially on Broadway, which is highly visible, is just let them be visible as opposed to trying to create a screen that looks like another story. I'm not saying that's the best way to approach it, but that's how we have. Okay. So would that be considered as well? You know, when we look at the purview, you know, anyway, because it makes more massing on top of the roof as well. Okay, so where have we come through? <laughs> Where we come through? So Commissioner Price has asked for possible mock-up. Uh, we're not deciding on this today, correct? Correct? Uh, well, I think it's before us, we have to... We can table. I was going to say, you need a motion. I think we do need a motion defer to, your, to push it further. To your next to next month's meeting? We can defer. Yes. To a definite date. Okay, to a definite date. Yeah. Good, Commissioners? Okay. Madam Chairman, I move that we defer this issue to the July meeting. There's a motion. Second. There's a second by Commissioner Cotton. All in favor? Uh, non opposition. So we are going to wait till next month. Thank you for the discussion. Sure. This is very good. Yeah, for further study. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you, staff, as well. Thank All right. Robin? Next more? is one more. This one probably won't be quite as challenging of a discussion. Um, because, not. <laughs> because design guidelines are guidelines and they're not specific rules, it is the role of the commission to interpret them on a case-by-case -case basis. All the stuff you've heard me say before. Um, generally, interpretations are created and they evolve over time. Those interpretations that would apply to most situations are often captured in the design guidelines via italicized language to provide direction to you as commissioners, to staff, and to applicants. Italicized information is not a new guideline and it does not conflict with existing guidelines, but provides information about how a design guideline has been interpreted in the past. A formal vote regarding interpretations is generally not necessary, as again, um, that evolves over time with decisions that you make. But it is suggested for this particular situation because, as described in this report, report this has been something that has been consistent and um, for a long time, from before my time, and I've been here 13 years. So I'm guessing at least 15 years, uh, the commission has required that masonry on new construction within the neighborhood conservation zoning overlays have dimensions, texture, and color that is consistent with historic masonry. And the appropriate brick color has primarily been interpreted as a historic red brick color. So the catch is, as you may remember from a couple of months ago, is uh, that in the neighborhood conservation zoning overlays, that same brick can be painted without your review. The reason we still were requiring that the color be a historic brick color was if that paint were ever to be removed, then the brick would be an appropriate color. Staff recommends no longer reviewing masonry color for new construction in neighborhood conservation zoning overlays for multiple reasons. Uh, one, we're not aware that anyone's removed paint. They're more likely to just paint over with a new color than to try to remove it. Most of the conservation guidelines don't mention color in terms of new construction. Three of them do. However, the guidelines for all of the conservation overlays also say that painting of masonry is not reviewed. The texture, details, and dimensions of masonry for new construction would still be reviewed and staff argues that that texture and dimension in the conservation overlays is more important than the color. In the case where an owner does not want that historic red brick color, they're gonna purchase the correct brick, they're gonna paint over it, and now the texture of that brick and mortar is lost. If the masonry itself is allowed to be any color than the, that the applicant wishes, then this could encourage the retention of that historic texture. A non-historic masonry color could be could help to distinguish new construction from historic construction as required by the Secretary of Interior Standards. So staff recommends that um, you vote on a new interpretation where we are not reviewing brick color for new construction in neighborhood conservation zoning overlays. Robin, is there any negatives? 
Um, someone could pick a brick color that others don't like. I guess, let me rephrase that. <laughs> In terms of your review, would there be any negatives to our making decisions or yours recommendation for staff? I'm not sure I understand the question. I'm sorry. You know what? Just simply, are there any negatives to this? I mean, I see positives in the way it's been listed, but is there anything that we don't know? There's unknowns that we would come up on. I, I don't know. Well, someone could choose an inappropriate color, um, paint it and remove the paint later, and then it'd be an inappropriate color. Someone could choose an inappropriate color and not paint it. Um, but in terms of wood-framed houses or lap-sided houses, you don't review that paint mm -hmm. color either. So someone could paint a lap-sided house pink with purple polka dots. They could choose brick that looked like that too, I guess, if it existed. So those would be the unintended consequences, but they can still do that anyway. And that's only neighborhood conservation overlay, not historic conservation right. overlays. We still review brick. Conservation, yes. Yeah, under historic. Let's be clear. I, I mean, this to me feels like a real positive. I mean, we struggle with this on so many projects. And I, I think that so many times today people want a black or a hot white. And so we require them to do a red brick and then paint it black or white. Well, we don't require them to paint it black or white, but to, to fill the owner's requirement, they do. So, and I think you're right, the texture of a black brick would be much more appealing than red brick painted black. And so... Uh, so I, I say this is a positive. Robin, do we have to open up a public hearing for this? You don't need to, but you're welcome to. We did the last one. What do you think, legal? I advise it, yes. I advise it. Okay, let's do that before we discuss. Open public hearing. Any comments? Close public hearing. Protocol. <laughs> I've seen some. Thank you. <laughs> I agree with Commissioner Stewart. This is one that... While I understand why we were, how it evolved that we were reviewing it in the first place, I drive by a house every day that I remember we just, we denied them the ability to have white brick. As soon as they built it with red brick, they painted it. It's pointless and it caught, adds unnecessary cost to applicants to do all this. So I, I, this is fine. Makes sense. Okay. Somebody want to make a motion? Madam Chairman, uh, with respect to the design guidelines interpretation revision of this date, I recommend approval uh, of this uh, staff recommendation. Motion. S second, Commissioner Cashin. All in favor? Uh, Any opposed? Hearing, seeing none. That motion passes. Thank you. Great conversation. Thanks. Thank Just you. a reminder that next month we'll be meeting at uh, the Bransford Conference Room where we've met in the past because this area will be early voting. Somebody text me. Okay. <laughs> meeting, meeting adjourned. I, meeting adjourned. <laughs> hey, by the way, commissioners. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again or for more information on this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.